Good afternoon. I know you're enjoying visiting friends and having an opportunity to be together in a room. Doesn't it feel wonderful, the energy and excitement of being in person again? So delighted to have you. <clears throat> I have to tell you, whenever I approach a podium when I'm going to do any kind of speech, I'm always terrified that it's going to be this high and people are going to say, is she standing up? I used to actually, I learned from Senator Boxer that I should always carry a box so that I could stand on it. I'm Ophelia Bascal, and my day job is I'm an affiliate at the Turner Center for Housing Innovation at UC Berkeley. I'm also a Go, go Bears. And if there's any of those USC people or UCLA people in the room, we'll forgive you. But uh, I'm also a member of the PPIC's uh, Board of Directors, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the PPIC second event of our um, 2023 speaker series on California's future. We would like to thank the sponsors of the speaker series. Um, their support makes it possible for these events to be free and available to the public. And the sponsors are listed on the screens and on our website. This series is also funded by the PPIC Donor Circle and the PPIC Corporate Circle. These are groups of individuals and organizations that provide generous support to PPIC. I encourage you to visit the website to find information on how you can join PPIC as a sponsor or a donor. We'd love to have you. As you may know, March is Women's History Month, and it's a in my opinion, a little California history, it's a good time to review that on this, this month and today. In its 172 years of statehood, California is one of 19 states that has never had a woman governor. We need to change that. In 1975, there were only three women who served in the California legislature. That number has steadily increased over time, and this year's legislative class includes the largest number of women in the state's history, 50 of the 120 members. It's not exactly parity, but we're on our way there. We are delighted to present today's program and featuring four influential women from the California State Legislature. And, but before we begin the program, a few housekeeping items. As a public charity, PPIC does not take or support positions on any ballot measure or legislation, nor does it support, endorse, or oppose any political parties or candidates for public office. At the end of today's program, there will be time to respond to audience questions. If you're here with us in Sacramento, please raise your hand if you have a question, and the PPIC staff will um, come to you with a microphone. We ask that you state your name and your organization before you ask your question. If you're joining us virtually, please email your questions to ppiceventquestions at gmail.com, and again, include your name and organization. PPIC will, uh, staff will be monitoring the emailed questions and will incorporate them in the Q&A as time permits. Lastly, if you haven't already, please silence your cell phone. Now on the, to the program. I'm very pleased to introduce today's moderator, Tani Contil Sakauye. Tani joined PPIC as president and CEO at the beginning of 2023. You may have known her in her former role as Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, and we're thrilled to have her on board. So with that, Tani, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ophelia. Welcome, everyone, to this wonderful event. And as you heard, March is Women's History Month, something worth repeating. And today is International Women's Day. We are very lucky and proud to have these distinguished women leaders with us. And while their extensive bios and accomplishments can be found on your table and also on the PPIC website, I'm going to take a few moments to introduce them. I'll begin with Senator Nancy Skinner, an accomplished legislator, a Democrat from Berkeley, representing Senate District 9. The senator served in local government and the assembly before her election to the Senate. The senator chairs the powerful Senate Budget and Fiscal Review Committee and the California Legislature's Women's Caucus. Next we have Senator Janet Nguyen, 
a Republican from Huntington Beach, representing Senate District 36. The senator served in local government and the assembly before being elected to the Senate. She chairs the Senate Republican Caucus. Next, we have assembly member Tina McKinner, a Democrat from Inglewood, representing District 61. The assembly member was elected in a special election in June 2022. She comes to the legislature after most recently serving as the civic engagement director for the nonprofit LA Voice. The assembly member chairs the powerful Public Employment and Retirement Committee. And next we have assembly member Liz Ortega, a Democrat from San Leandro, representing Assembly District 20. The assembly member was elected in November 2022, and she comes to the legislature most recently, having served as the statewide political director for AFSCME Local 3299, the University of California's largest employee union. Welcome, what a pleasure it is to have all of you here. This first question will be to all of you, and I'll start by asking first Senator Skinner. The legislative class of 23-24 includes the largest number of women in the state's history. So here's the question. From your perspective, how has the legislature's increased gender diversity influenced California's policies? Thank you so much. On. Right? Yes. Good. Okay. Thank you very much, Tony, and let me thank you for your incredible service as our Supreme Court Justice. And I'm very glad that you've continued your public service. I view PPIC as public service. Um, anyway, so I have the great good fortune of chairing the Legislative Women's Caucus. I was vice chair the previous couple of years and have been active in it for um, since the day I arrived in the legislature. And about 10 years ago, we had only 22% of the legislature was uh, female. We are now at 42%. And we did an incredible leap in the last eight years. And about eight years ago, the Legislative Women's Caucus, the members decided we were gonna make it our focus to increase the number of women. That we did not like the fact that California was so underrepresented. Um, that the legislature did not have a real adequate representation of women. So we really put a very concerted effort towards that. I think that was, uh, we're very proud of that success and that we have 50 today. And as was mentioned, we do intend to get to parity and above. We don't, you know, it's like, what, why is this something about equal? Nobody's ever worried about the fact that you've always had so many more men. So let's uh, get to the point where you might be worried because there's no men. Now, what is it that, that the presence of women in the legislature has made a difference on? There's lots of studies that indicate what kind of, when a legislative body or even a corporate board that has better gender diversity, what types of policies that affect. But let me just be concrete. Concretely, what our Women's Caucus has focused on for a good 10 years is really lobbying to greatly increase the state's investment in and commitment to the early care and education of our zero to four year olds. Our public school students, which start now for because of TK, but before age five, they, well, you know, years, they would have some years where we're, our school funding wasn't as good, they were in effect protected in the budget by Prop 98. Whereas our zero to four children, no protection whatsoever, no guarantee that they would have quality care. And this of course affected the workforce because women who cannot uh, afford or obtain quality care for their children have a difficulty time getting in the workforce. It also affected children's poverty. And California has the highest percent of child poverty in the country. So we have made a huge commitment to that. And as a result, we have doubled the state's funding towards early care and education and are gonna continue that. And we've also focused on looking at those areas of the workforce where, they're, where women are not well represented and uh, a couple other things like that, but I'll stop there. 
Thank you, Senator. Thank you. So uh, same question then to Assemblymember McKinner about how it is, in your opinion, uh, gender diversity has influenced California's policies or even diversity writ large. We're moms. We're people of color. How has that influenced California's policies? Um, good, good morning. Is it still morning? Good morning or good afternoon. Um, I'm only the 20th black woman, black woman to serve in the California state legislature. And so we, have, we still have a kind of a lot of work to do on that. Um, the, the, the state has been chartered for about 173 years, and it has exactly 21 black women who have served. Lola Smallwood is the last one to get sworn in. And so I think when you bring diversity and you bring women to the table, we're about our families, right? Most women, we're about our families. We're used to taking care of our families. So the legislation that you'll see coming out of this group, I, I believe, will be around housing. It'll be around jobs diversity on jobs, it'll be a, around equity, it'll be around public safety. And so, I think that having women here is just gonna make a tremendous difference because we just legislate different. We, we take care of the family different. And so that's, that's what I think you guys will see out of this, this group. Thank you, Assembly Member. How about uh, Senator Wynn, same question. Thank you. You know, I think increasing diversity and quite frankly, just different perspective. Because we all have our own different perspective and our different life and how we grew up. My family, came, we, we escaped communism when I was a little girl, came to the United States. I was, our family, uh, I didn't speak any English. Our family was on welfare food stamps. And so I am able to bring that perspective to the legislative body. And actually, what was very proud for me is I, this year, I'm the only two Asian American women in the legislature. The last two years, I was the only one. Um, and so we have a lot more to give, but one thing is that Asian Americans, there's a, there's a lot of different perspective and a lot of subgroups in Asian Americans as well. Um, there's currently two Asian American women. Um, both of them are Vietnamese American. We both have the same last name. It's a win-win situation, you can't lose. <laughs> um, and so, but I think what, what, what has been mentioned by both the Senate and the Assembly member is that the, those different perspectives, us as mothers, I have a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old. I know what it's like today to live in when inflations are affecting all of us. When I have a 12-year-old who can eat a Big Mac, chicken nuggets, or large fries. <laughs> Actually, 20 chicken nuggets. So that tells you our grocery bill is quite a bit when he has his growth spurs. And I live that life. I'm living what you're living. And I think that's what's important when we have diversity that can bring to the table a different perspective, whether it's from North Sacramento, um, North or, um, California or Southern California or Central California. It is very different. California itself is so unique that in terms of culturally, diversity, perspective, we're so different, and I think the more we have in differences of our opinions, the more we can actually legislate that we can legislate to work for everybody in California. Thank you. Uh, Assembly Member Ortega, from your perspective and experience, how has uh, gender diversity or multi-diversity influenced California's policies? Well, first of all, buenas tardes. Uh, <laughs> What a beautiful day to be spending with this panel right here. I mean, you talk about International Women's Day. Uh, we look beautiful. Uh, Thank you for that. So I will start with, uh, you know, it's hard to talk about what we will be doing without talking about a little bit about where we all came from, right? So in terms of that perspective, I mean, I came to this country uh, when I was three years old. My mother crossed the border illegally as an undocumented woman by herself with me as a three-year-old and my six-month-old brother on her lap. And so that is something that I carry with me every day throughout my career. If she could do that, then we can do anything. And, and that's what I plan to do. Uh, you know, I spent my career fighting for working families, making sure that we have access to good jobs, making sure we have childcare, uh, making sure we have access to healthcare, all of the things that we all care about very much and is the reason we are on this stage today. Uh, but I think the one thing that we, uh, 
in addition to just that vision and experience, we bring that voice into that room where we're often unseen and unheard. And as you will hear from many of us today, none of us are very quiet. <laughs> and we will make sure we're seen and heard and that we deliver for all women in the state of California in this beautiful place we call the United States. Uh, my mom brought me here for that American dream and my job is to make sure that it's attainable for all of us. Thank you so much. These are awesome answers. And I know that we could go on and on. Uh, we have limited time, but this has been just a tremendous first round of answers. Thank all of you. Thank you. The next question for each of you is a little bit more about how or why did you first get interested in politics and elected office? In other words, what was the initial pull to get you here today? And I'm gonna start with you, Assembly Member Ortega. Uh, the initial pull, well, first of all, I've been asked many, many times. Uh, prior to coming here, I, you know, I've worked for labor for over 20 years. And part of that uh, experience meant identifying and getting other folks elected into office that shared our values. And so I've been asked many times, and many, like many other women, I've always said no. You know, I'm busy, I'm working, I have kids, I got this, I, got, I, I don't want to do that. And eventually, um, I looked in the mirror and said, well, if I don't do it, then who is? And I know uh, that a voice needs to be had, and this is an opportunity that is not about Liz Ortega. It's about the hundreds and millions of people that require us to be at that table with that voice. And so that's what got me here. Uh, and the beautiful uh, constituents of Assembly District 20, half a million of them, decided that I was the right person to send here to fight for all of us. And that's how I got here. And with the support of my family and friends. Thank you. We're glad you looked in the mirror. Uh, <laughs> Senator Skinner. I was a, a student at UC Berkeley, and I had never taken a poli-sci class, I'd never thought about running for office, but I was very active in a number of uh, campus and community issues. And there was a tradition in Berkeley amongst a certain political group to always run a student for the city council. Now, their primary purpose of that was, it was a get out the vote measure, that if you put a student on the ballot, and none of the students had ever won, that if you put a student on the ballot, that would motivate more of the Berkeley students to vote in the municipal election. So it was a very explicit get out the vote measure. And so, uh, so I'm active with this group, and uh, they start recruiting me, and I'm like, city council, or, you know, anyway, but I ended up running, and like I said, no student had won. And I, I took it very seriously. I didn't run to lose, but I really didn't think I would win. Well, I was the top vote getter and I won. <laughs> Starting history even then, Senator. How about you, Assembly Member McKinner? What was the initial poll? Well, I would tell you guys that in 1992, we had the Rodney King riot, what we call this uh, LA civil unrest. Um, in LA, and that got me off the sofa. I had never thought about politics. If someone would have told me when I was in high school and college that I would be an assemblywoman, I would say, you're crazy. Um, I never thought about politics, but after that happened, I have two sons. Now they're 32 and 35. And I had two sons, young sons at the time, and I thought, I better get off the sofa. I better get up and pay attention to what's going on because I just saw a black man get beat on the video camera, they, back then they had the big video cameras, you guys. Not our phones, but the big, big video cameras. And um, after that, I just didn't sit down. I had to get involved in my community, make sure I know what's going on. And then when, when the seat opened up last year, um, I looked around at who was, who was running, and I thought, this is not the time to have mediocre people serving. And so, <laughs> I just said, <laughs> I'm gonna put myself out here. It's gonna be very, it's one of the toughest things I've ever done in my whole life. But I put my, I decided to put myself out there because I knew that I would serve my people well and I would put people before power. Thank you so much, thank you. A time in history, a time in history. Same question to you, Senator Wynn. So in my family, we get three career choices. 
doctor, lawyer, engineer. Um, I was heading to UC Irvine wanting to be an obstetrician. I was working three jobs, going to school full time, and I took a community political class to meet my social science credit. The, general, the visiting professor was the chairman of the Orange County Board of Supervisors. Mm. I thought to myself, whatever. I, you know, I have chemistry, I have physics, I've got all these bio classes that's much more important to me. Uh, and, but then after class ended, I thought to myself, maybe if I can get a recommendation letter from this seems to be important person, it might help my application for med school. So I asked to volunteer, five hours, became 10. 10 years later, I come back as the youngest county supervisor in Orange County's history. And thank you. And if you, and re, people ask me why, why would I wanna run for office? If you think about it, the light that's shining at us, the food you're eating, the clothes you're wearing, the air you're breathing, whether you like it or not, but it's governed by government. What I realized that I wanna be I want to be at the table and not on the menu. I want to be there when laws are created for or against someone like me, whether that be a perspective of a mother, a taxpayer, a business owner, a refugee, a Gen X, you name it. I want to be there and to say, wait a minute, if you did X, this is how it's going to affect these individuals or these people. Thank you, and thank you for that reminder about how we are all governed by statute and regulation. This next question is also for all of you. Uh, you have alluded to some of these, but I'm going to start then uh, with you, uh, Senator Nguyen. In this legislative cycle, what are some of your key priorities? To, uh, a few of my priorities, one is education. This pandemic and the closure of the pandemic has affected all, most of the children in California. And we're gonna see that consequences in the next decade. And those children, my 10 year old is struggling and is still struggling. And to think about it, our family, both my husband and I have our college degree. We both speak English fluently. We are both educated enough to be able to help our, our, our child. But because of what has happened, it has put my son backwards and not forward. So he's been getting the extra help and we've been working with him, but imagine how many other children are out there who doesn't have the privilege of having parents like us, who aren't in families like us, who don't have access to the internet, who don't have access to even food. So these are the kind of, so first for me is education and making sure that we put the funding into education to moving forward, not backwards, and helping our students who have struggled or, or are still struggling. Second, crime. We need to stop this, and the fentanyl that's affecting our children in California. Fentanyl is the number one killer for young adults 18 to 44 in this country. The number one killer. And now they're affecting children that are 10 years old, 12 years old, 15 years old, and 17 years old. It has skyrocketed. So in terms of making sure that, I wanna make sure that when my children are out there playing at the beach, at the park, at the movie theater, that I know they're safe. Just yesterday alone, four houses down from my house, our house, there was a burglary, twice. And so now I'm telling my children who is walking there, our German shepherd down the street, up and down, several times a day, now they have to be extremely careful. And we have cameras as well. We shouldn't, as parents, have to be worried that our children walking down the street to walk the dog. And we, we shouldn't have to worry about that. And that's where it's the skyrocketing of the crime that's going across the state needs to stop. And I am working on legislation in that. Last is, as I mentioned earlier, inflation, cost of living. Wanting to buy a home in California for our young adults is a pipe dream now. It's impossible. I'm afraid for my children when they get to that point where then they'll be like, I'm leaving California because I can't afford it anymore. I want my children to be able to say, I want to live in California. 
or I'm going to go to another state, not because I can't afford to live there, mommy and daddy, but it's because they chose to. For whatever reason, a job or whatever it is, we need to get our hand on the cost of living for our families, and that comes with whether it's the gas prices, whether it comes with grocery. We, our family, one, um, we do about a dozen eggs or more per week. And I don't eat the eggs that much. It's the three. It's the two boys that I have. So at the end of the day is I'm living the life of a mom who has young children today and are still trying to make sure that I can provide for them. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. It is those diversity of experience uh, as a lived life that you are describing. Thank you. Uh, that very same question to you, Assemblymember McKinner. Well, first and foremost, I, my first bill, AB1, um, the staff unionization bill, that's my top priority. Um, I am a staffer, hashtag I am a staffer. And so I bring that experience to the legislature. And I want to make sure that when I leave the building, that this staff, both current and future staff, have a place where there's equity, fairness, and they're safe in their workplace. Look. We're having a hard time getting staff now. When I was here six years ago, people were beating down the door to work here. They are not anymore. And it's because of what's happening in the building. And so I just wanna, want, wanna make sure that we get quality staff in the building, that staff can um, have the right to join collective bargaining, and I'm very excited about that one. That's, the, that's my top priority. Next. Thank you, staff out there. I know it's a lot of people out there that could say hashtag I am a staffer. Um, the sec second thing is housing. Everybody deserves to have housing, you guys. I've never seen this state like this. This is just, it breaks my heart to see all the people sitting on the street. And so I'm co-authoring SB4 with Senator Weiner, which is the faith-based faith housing, because our, um, our religious folks want to build housing on their land, and we should, they should be able to help out with the problem. Secondly, I have AB 1418, which is crime-free housing, my crime-free housing bill. Look, people are getting put out of their housing for a lot of different things, you guys. So when, when I talk about the crime-free housing, um, Senator, nobody wants crime on their, on their block. But if I'm a woman in my 50s and I made a mistake in my 20s, I have a pro problem renting an apartment. That's ridiculous. We gotta keep people in their housing. Also, they have these things called nuisance ordinance. So I could be playing cards. I'm, you know, I'm African-American, I like to play spades. So we play spades in my family. We get loud, and the neighbors may, you know, we might, they, we might disturb them a little bit. And back in the day, maybe someone didn't want to come and knock on your door, and they call the police. The police comes and knocks and says, can you keep it down? Well, that's a reason to evict somebody now. And so we have to stop the cities and the counties from, from um, enacting landlords to um, do uh, criminal background checks and to kick people out just because they've made a mistake. And so housing... Um, staff unionization, those are my top two priorities. Thank you, Assembly Member. Uh, same question to you, Senator Skinner. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sort of known for liking to take big things on. <clears throat> and uh, last year, I was incredibly um, honored and proud that California and we did this through the budget. I carried a bill initially, but we did it through the budget because there was such a strong partnership with the governor's office and both houses to make California the first state to provide universal school meals to all of our K through 12 children. So every public school child now gets two free meals, does not have to fill out the form, doesn't have to stand in the shame line. For those of you who might have been on free and reduced lunch, you might remember that you had to be in a certain line and such, and uh, maybe your parents hadn't played the full bill, so you got either no lunch or something, you know, an apple. Anyway, we've eliminated all that, and we're now providing uh, many children half the calories that they'll get in a day. Um, so that's an incredible thing. but. We, the federal nutrition guidelines, and California follows those, we have um, guidelines for limits on the, the amount of fat in our meals, certain other things, but we have no guidelines regarding added sugar and added salt. And we would look at chronic diseases 
which often, you know, the beginning of a chronic disease can be conceded when you're young. And high diets, high of sodium and sugar, can contribute to a great number of chronic diseases, diabetes being one. So uh, the federal government has just released some new nutrition guidelines. I want California to adopt those even a little bit better so that our universal school meals are quite healthy. So that's one big priority. Um, another priority I have, and we're talk, uh, our colleague talked about fentanyl. It is a horrible scourge right now. Um, but some of you may have noticed there's recent reports, both in Washington Post and New York Times, about how easy it is for any of you, anyone in this room, and of course our kids, to buy fentanyl through social media platforms. Now when we talk about that age group who are dying of fentanyl overdoses, most of them are not going on the street and finding some drug dealer to buy those. They are buying it on the internet. Now, the social media platforms have the ability to design their algorithms to protect our children from that harm. You do not see these same incidences of children being directed to sites that are pro-suicide, or choke the choke challenge, or sites where they can buy fentanyl, or sites where they can buy ghost guns. You don't see that in Europe, and you don't see it because Europe regulates our social media sites, not their content, but that the algorithms. We could do the same. Now, of course, our social media could themselves take responsibility and design their algorithms differently so that they aren't directing our children to sites that do harm, but they have not opted to do so yet. So I am carrying the bill that is very targeted at the, the direction towards suicidal sites, purchase of fentanyl and other illegal drugs, purchase of ghost guns, and other, si other content that does harm to our children. So that's another priority bill I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Assemblymember Ortega, your legislative priorities. Uh, since we're talking about fentanyl, I, will, uh, I also have a bill related to fentanyl. Mine takes a little bit of a different approach. You know, right now we're talking about the statistics. It's the number one killer in America outside of COVID, right? And during the COVID, the height of the COVID pandemic, we had, you know, two, 300 people dying a day. That's the number we're hearing today with fentanyl. Uh, 200 people a day are dying. And it's, you know, not overdose, it's poisoning. Because now we're talking about nine, 10 year olds that are being poisoned, babies that are being poisoned on the playground. And so there's life-saving medication that's out there right now that's only accessible to very few people. And so my bill will make it, make it accessible to everyone. So while we figure out how to stop this poison for coming into our communities, uh, and we figure out the, the punishment or you know what we're gonna do about it, it's here, it's now. So if there's life-saving medication that as a mother I can have in my purse, I want to make sure that I have it in case I ever need it, in case my baby is in the playground and accidentally gets up, because a little tiny bit will kill you. And so my bill is about affordability and accessibility. There's life-saving medication that's already out there. Um, so that's going to be my priority. Thank you, it's life-saving, uh, so we can applaud that. Uh, and my other priorities, is, you know, as my uh, colleagues talked about, it's you know, keeping people in their homes. We, wanna, we talk a lot about homelessness and how to tackle the homelessness issue, uh, and the number one way to tackle it is to keep people in their homes. So making sure they're not evicted, making sure they're not put out in the street, making sure we have programs in place for people to stay where they are. And so really working on that uh, protection, uh, making sure people don't end up homeless. Uh, and then, you know, along the lines of just access to healthcare and, um, you know, education. And then, you know, we're talking a lot about our budget right now and making sure that cuts are not made uh, to the programs we need the most especially during times of budget cuts. Uh, we need to make sure we protect our kids, our seniors, our mothers, uh, and making sure that that's the voice that's heard when discussions are happening around what we do with this budget that's kind of looming amongst us and potential cuts. 
Thank you so much. I think all of us hearing the priorities are very inspired and supportive of what you're saying here today collectively. We're about to go into a Q&A from the audience, but I want to ask this lightning round fast, one, a phrase or a sentence from each of you to answer, starting with you, uh, Senator Skinner, and then moving down, and that is, what advice would you give to a woman interested in following your path? This is the lightning round. Um, Get, start calling your network, start figuring out how, to, how you're going to raise the money you need, and uh, just get going. Thank you. Assemblymember Ortega. Win, win, win. <laughs> Don't do it or lose. If you're going to do it, do it to win. Thank you. Senator Nguyen. The sky's the limit. Aim high. Run as hard as you can. Ignore everybody who says you can't do it, and just do it. Thank you. <laughs> Assemblymember McKinner. Build a team, build a team, build a team. Look at your friends next to you. Build a team. They'll help you out when it's time to run. Woohoo! Very good. Thank you for that advice. Valuable and time-tested experience. Now we are turning to that portion of our program where we are involving you, the audience, for Q&A. And we have some great PPIC runners out there with hands waving who have a mic to get to you. So they're in the back. Please raise your hands to ask this distinguished panel questions. Yes, Hannah has, uh, and it has a question. Please state your name and if you have an organization and stand up and ask your question. Thank you. Okay. Um, Janice Rocco with the California Medical Association. Could some of you talk a little bit about what the Legislative Women's Caucus and the legislature generally working with the governor have been doing lately to protect access to reproductive health care? Terrific. Senator Skinner? Janice, thank you for that question. I would have included that as my other thing the Women's Caucus has really focused on. Um, women are under a complete assault in this country right now. That our, that our ability to have bodily autonomy would be so questioned and uh, criminalized. So the Legislative Women's Caucus, working with a group called the Future of Abortion Council, which is made up of organizations such as Planned Parenthood, NARAL, the National Abortion Rights Action League, Black Women for Wellness, Latinas for Reproductive Justice, and many more, we uh, came up with like a 15 bill package last year that had the support of the governor, and we uh, extended the ability, we extended the access to contraceptive and abortion care. We extended, f expanded funding. We supported our healthcare workers in this uh, regard. We offered protections to the healthcare workers who might serve a person who is in a state where it's criminalized. We also offered protections that if you came here from a state where it was criminalized, that you would be a safe haven. That. Uh, that the law enforcement from another state could not get you. Um, we can't do as much protection when you return to your state, but certainly we can when you're in California. So those are some of the kinds of things that we did. And we have another set of bills that we are planning for this year. Our Women's Caucus meeting is today, and in the next couple of days, we will fin finalize that package, and you will hear us being once again very bold, very assertive on this issue. Thank you, Senator. Any other? I see a hand raised here in Anne's section. Hi there, I'm Amber Mace with the California Council on Science and Technology. And all of your priorities are rooted in useful, accurate data to substantiate the, the policies that you want to move forward. And you know whether it's health outcomes or educational outcomes or housing, uh, direction in housing. And I would love for you to share with us if you feel like you have access to the knowledge that you need in the forms that you need it, when you need it, and how can we do a better job of getting you information to inform your policies? Thank you. Thank you, and I believe all of you spoke to housing, but I'm gonna turn this over to, uh, to first uh, Senator Nguyen, who talked about housing, and also all of you, but please feel free to jump in. I believe that we have enough data. I think it's just a matter of will and being able to work across the aisle, because I think the four of us here we, I think most of the time, up, us up here in the legislative body, we agree about 80% of the time. There's that 20% that we don't, we might have to respectfully di uh, disagree. But we also, though, I believe that every one of us have here, we want the same outcome. We just have a different pathway to getting there. 
Um, and so in terms of data, we, I believe we received a lot of data, but what some of the data in terms of housing that I think is missing is the affordability of it and, and how fast we can build something. In the sense of like, I had a bill back about six years ago uh, just to find out how much it costs to build a single family home and what that cost would be, whether, you know, city, water, you know, system, whatever it is, I wanted to know what that cost would be. Because it, are our housing costs overinflated or is it just about right? None of us can answer that question. I mean, I know the supply and demand um, concept, but it would be good for us to understand what that actual cost is, not just the materials, but from all the local government all the way to the top, what that would be. Thank you, Tony. Assembly Member McKinner, and then Senator Skinner. Yes, um, last year I did a bill, AB 1743. I hope I got the number right, Natalie. Um, AB 1743, and that was to get collect data. Because when I got here, the first thing I wanted to know about housing is like, where have we built housing in the last couple of years? When I was home working at a nonprofit, we were, you know, we keep hearing about uh, every, every city's boasting about how much housing they're, they're building, but we really don't know exactly how much new housing has been built in the last five years. And so I asked the question, they didn't have the data, and so I did a bill. It was, it was um, passed into law and the governor signed it, and so we should be getting that data back because it would be interesting to know where do we need to put data. I mean, put housing instead of just you know, just going blindly. And so I think that was, um, sometimes we don't have enough data. Thank you, PPIC loves data. Um, Senator Skinner, well, actually, and then uh, Assembly uh, Member that's Ortega. what I was gonna answer, make a plug for PPIC. <laughs> Please Seriously. do! Seriously, well, the reports, PPIC reports are incredibly helpful to legislators in terms of when we are uh, formulating our legislative and budgetary concepts. PPIC reports are incredibly helpful, as are your polls. Um, the other incredible resource that the legislature has is our legislative analyst office. California wisely created that office in the 40s. We are the first state to do so, to create an independent, nonpartisan entity that could provide the legislature information, data, and analysis that, you know, not from the governor's office or not for an advocacy group, but just, you know, here's, here's the facts as best as we know it. Now, unfortunately, we have not funded the, it, we have the same number of analysts in the LAO's office that we did in the 60s because of uh, a proposition that limited the legislature's budget, which is really unfortunate because we, we have the same number of analysts when the state's budget was 46 billion compared to 460 billion. So we could improve there. But around the housing, we could always benefit with additional data, but we do have two great resources in PPIC and the LAO. Thank you so much. And Assemblymember Ortega. Yeah, PPIC, you guys are the best. Uh, we definitely appreciate all the reports and the data. And to answer your question about do we have enough, I don't think we ever have enough, uh, especially with our ever-changing world. Um, and as a new legislator, I have been surprised at the amount of information. And we, I mean, we have some of the most talented, educated people in the world that we now have access to. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what I'm looking for as a new legislator is where do I go? Uh, the, uh, you know, in the orientation, I said, we need to know where, where to go to get this data and this information because there's so much of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that would be an ask that I have is, you know, compile a place where we can go um, and ask for this information. Thank you, Turner Center is another great resource. Same. On your the Turner Center at Cal, who's on your board, PPIC's Thank you. With board. Ophelia Bascal. There, I mean, it is. The reports go on. If you have some interest in housing questions specific to California, go on the Turner Center's website. Excellent, excellent. Another question here at the front table. Hi there. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm Cassandra Pye with Lucas Public Affairs and a proud member of the PPIC board. So the talk around um, uh, our re research means a lot to me personally. Um, my question is about bipartisanship, which as many of you know is, a, a, is core to our mission. We are a nonpartisan research uh, entity. Name two or three issues that you think we could get resolved this year with bipartisan support. 
Because what I've seen in a lot of spaces, particularly since this Women's Caucus has gotten so large, is just so many opportunities for people to build relationships, for women to build relationships. And I just wonder if that's going to lead to potentially an issue or two being resolved with um, the support of both parties. Terrific. Thank you. Who'd like? Yes. Assemblymember Ortega and then Senator Nguyen. Uh, I think for my experience, uh, I joint authored a bill with uh, my Republican colleague around fentanyl and access to Narcan, that life-saving medication. So I think that's a bipartisan issue where we want to make sure that we keep our community alive. And um, this is something that's impacting all of us, regardless of party. Um, and then around public safety, I sit on the public safety committee and actually yesterday we worked, I worked with uh, one of our colleagues on the other side, Republican, around some of the public safety issues uh, that we're facing in our state. Uh, and so I think those are areas that I think, you know, we're, like you said, you know, we agree 80% of the time and then there's that 20 where we kind of look at each other. Uh, but then we, you know, go to coffee and figure it out. And, some, and you also have to know that we're not always going to agree. Uh, it's impossible. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're all here for a reason, and that is to serve the state of California. And that you know, might mean we work together, and it might mean that we don't. Very reassuring. Thank you, Senator Nguyen. Hey, I don't agree with my husband 100% of the time. <laughs> so don't expect me to agree with you 100% of the time. Um, I think I agree uh, with the assemblywoman. Fentanyl is one. Uh, the other one, I think, is homelessness, that, which includes mental health. I think there's a lot of bipartisan effort that can, ha can and will happen. Um, I'm working with um, uh, our Senate uh, chair on health, Eggman, since I'm vice chair of health. We're looking at, she's looking at a lot of mental health bills that she's going to be authoring or has already so far. And we're going to be working side by side and trying to help move that needle in terms of mental health, especially when it impacts uh, with the homeless population. Thank you. Assemblymember McKinner and then Senator Skinner, we're going to give you the last word on this question. Well, AB1 is a bi um, I have bipartisan support because it's going to help everybody in the building. Um, when I went to talk to my Republican colleagues about the inequity of pay in their office and their budget, it, 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 um, two of them signed on as co-authors. And so I think we will get more because um, we want to bring, bring equity to to pay for the employees because like the, the uh, Republican staff may get a smaller budget and then the, the Democratic staff has a huge budget or you have a male that comes in as a chief of staff, they make $180,000. A woman, a black woman comes in, she makes 90000 And so we want to we wanna bring some equity into pay and I think that that is going to, AB1 is going to pass this year with bipartisan support. Wait, I didn't know that the um, Democratic chief of staff makes one hundred eighty. dollars that's no, we don't. Side. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Well, they, do, they do have chiefs with staffs that make 180. Well, this is, this is all very interesting. Uh, <laughs> Senator Skinner. Some of my most significant bills were bipartisan. My, uh, the reform to felony murder was co-authored by Joel Anderson, who was the uh, vice chair of the Public Safety Committee when I was uh, chair of that committee. And uh, he was a, it was a great partnership. Um, and we passed that bill, it was a hard bill to pass, we passed it, and uh, we now have a situation where many people who are serving murder sentences but did not commit the murder, did not participate in the murder, did not plan the murder, have now been resentenced and released from prison. Um, the other one, school meals. School meals was completely bipartisan supported. So I don't think there was any no vote on our universal school meals. And uh, uh, my good colleague in the Senate, Rosalisi Ochoa Bogue, was one of the co-authors. Um, and I'm hoping right now there's a number of children and teens in the building working on the bill regarding social media. So I'm hoping that those kids can help uh, motivate my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support that bill. Thank you, very exciting and informational. Thank you. We have another question, and I think uh, Anne has the, no, Nathania, please, thank you. Hi, I'm Samia Kamal with CalMatters. Um, you've talked about the impact that having more women has had on policy. I'm wondering if you think it's had any impact on the culture of the legislature itself? 
Very good question. So I heard a yes here from yes. Assemblymember McKinnon. And this McKinner, is why so you I can think start. AB1 will pass. I keep, I keep plugging it, right? Yeah, no, I think it, it will have um, some circumstances on the legislature. We'll see a lot of good bills come out, but then we'll see the culture change because I was one of the original signers to the We Said Enough um, movement, um, the Me Too movement that sparked a couple of years ago. And I think that we'll see um, staff getting treated with a lot more respect. Now, I'm sorry, man, I don't mean that men don't treat women with people with respect, but I just think you will see a lot more respect for staff with the women, with, with bringing in the 50 women. And we hope to um, elect more in, in 2024. And so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel care to speak to that issue? Senator Skinner? We'll, we'll see. I mean, it's one of those where uh, each of us, um, male, female, regardless of our uh, background or culture, we're unique individuals. And we bring what we bring to the table. I guess I sort of always feel that diversity in both gender and race is essential because it reflects our communities and that it's not so much because it will necessarily make a difference in the culture or make a difference on what issues are. I would never dictate to a woman or an, uh, one of our black uh, legislators that they should focus on X or Y. I would just say that that diversity is in and of itself of value because it reflects California. Thank you, thank you. Good, great answers here. Senator Nguyen. I think it has. Um, throughout the years, this is my seventh year up here, throughout the years you've seen the focus on children, lunch meals, t uh, pre-K. I think that's where you're seeing a lot of these issues that's coming to the forefront that not that it has been ignored, but it's becoming more and more important because you have mothers up on the stage or up at the dais and, 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 ha and being able to make these legislation or author these legislations. So I think you will continue to see that impact. Um, the diversity, whether it's gender, whether it's ethnicity, you're gonna start, you, I actually, last seven years have seen that impact. Thank you. Last question, and we have it, uh, Jerrica has a person. Hi there, my name's Laramie Langdon. I'm with Perry Communications Group. I was just wondering, California and Sacramento especially has been facing increasing rates of human trafficking and sex trafficking. What are you guys doing to combat that? Thank you. Anyone care to take the uh, answer first? Thank you, Senator Skinner. That area has been another focus of the Women's Caucus. You've seen a good deal of bills um, and w one of the first things was redefining, let's take uh, Child, children that are in prostitution. For years, California treated it that if you were a child in prostitution, and I'm talking a person under 18, that you are a criminal. Versus if you take any other sexual interaction with the minor, the perpetrator of the sexual interaction is the criminal, not the minor. But, and so it was a very, we had a very skewed thinking that somehow young girls just chose this profession. No, what we've learned over time is that no, they are recruited, they are groomed, and whether it's a big sex tra trafficking ring or a pimp with two to three women that, or young girls that he is uh, in effect um, t trafficking. Um, so that alone, we had to first get law enforcement and just start culturally to wrap our arms around this. And for so long, both human trafficking and sex trafficking was viewed as something that, oh, we're, we're bringing people internationally versus that it's our own kids, and especially our kids that are in the foster system. So there's been a really huge 180 degree change in perspective around this, and I think that while there's probably still improvements to be made, we're doing much, much better. Thank you. We've been truly uh, informed and inspired by this distinguished panel for all of their questions, answers, and insights. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you to all of you for making this a memorable event that is viewed by over 500 today and on YouTube later and on our website. 
And also thank you to our sponsors, and this concludes PPIC's second speaker series event. Thank you. Yay.